and I'm live. Hello, hello. I am Brandon Kirby, the Drunken Libertarian. Happy to be here at the Taxation is Theft 2020 Fest. And with me here today is uh, Mr. L.K. Samuels. Uh, Mr. Samuels, how are you doing today? Oh, I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine. I just had a, a martini. So. <laughs> you what now? I just had a martini, so I'm oh, fine. Okay. Uh, well, I got to catch up then, so I'll play yeah, a little I bit. I got to have a dirty one. You know, they're the best ones. <laughs> there we go. Uh, just by way of uh, biographical note here, uh, okay, Samuels is the author of three books. His most recent nonfiction book is Killing History, The False Left-Right Political Spectrum and the Battle Between the Free Left and the Status Left, 2019. Samuels is a former Northern Vice Chair of the Libertarian Party of California from 2003 until 2007. And this promises to be one of the more interesting talks I think we'll uh, have of the weekend. Uh, Mr. Samuels, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, that's, that's uh, great. Uh, where do I start? Uh, you know, this book took six years, has 1,500 footnotes, um, and... Um, and I really wasn't planning on, on moving in this direction. I had another book. It was uh, going to be called Government, A State of Deception. And this was going to be a small chapter on the political spectrum uh, because I've written about things like this back when I was in college. So what, what happens? I all of a sudden run into a um, dilemma. Um, there is a quote in the Doctrine of Fascism. It says a, a century of, of authority a century of the right, a century of fascism. Well, guess what? That's not true. I actually bought the booklet. I don't know if you can see it there. And um, it doesn't say that. Historical sabotage. It says a century of authority, a century of the left, and the left is capitalized, a century of fascism. And uh, all of a sudden, you know, uh, I had to do deeper research. And that's what led me to Killing History. Killing History is basically what George Orwell was talking about. Right. He said that if you want to control the future, you have to control the past. And what he meant is you killed the true history of the past and put your history in. And that will lead you to the future. Because now the, everything you're talking about is on a, a false past instead of a true one. And so that's why. I uh, started to write this book, and unfortunately, it's a little too long. Some people said, you know, it's about 600 pages a lot. Well, you know, it's, it's a lot of, lot of uh, material I cover in there. And so what I kind of show is that the political spectrum has been altered. Um, and so I had to go back to, the, back to the beginning. Now, almost everyone says, you know, the, the political spectrum began with the French Revolution. Right, and everybody has a wrong idea of the French Revolution. I mean, it's just incredible. the The French Revolution, uh, seventeen eighty nine, it started, was actually a libertarian revolution. Thomas Paine was there. Thomas Paine, and Jefferson was there just before it began. He wrote the the Declaration of of Rights uh, with Lafayette, and that was approved later on in the French Assembly. So you had these classical liberals. The left sitting, uh, or classical liberals sitting on the left side, where you had the the authoritarians sitting on the right, the church and the monarch, and dictator, you know, whatever. And the libertarians were capitalist. There were merchants, uh, traders. I mean, this is the. Mer In fact, before they attacked the Bastille, they actually attacked some toll booths, tax toll booths. You had to pay a tax to get into into. Uh, into Paris, and people hated that. So they went there and just ripped them down. Then they went for the the uh, prison, the uh, Bastille. And so when they took control, they um, lowered taxes. They gave rights to Jews, gave uh, rights to colored people uh, to have citizenship. They made it easy for peasants to own their own land. They got rid of the last vestiges of, of, of feudalism. Uh, they did amazing stuff. They even had a, a uh, they were trying to bring in a gun rights uh, one, but they didn't quite get it through. But, you know, this was a, a certain um, group. Sometimes they call it the bourgeois, I call it the bourgeoisie left or the free left. Right. Uh, and, and, and eventually, a few years later, about two, three years later, the social revolutionaries came in with Robespierre, 
And they wanted free uh, schooling. They wanted free food. They wanted all this free stuff. And anybody that was against that was a counter-revolutionary. And so what they did is um, put 22 French assemblymen on trial, trial for uh, counter-revolutionary activities. These were some of the original people. A lot of people actually got out. They could see what direction the mob was going to go in because the French Re the assembly was taken over by the mob, basically. And they condemned them to death. And they cut off their heads. Took 36 minutes to cut off 22 heads. Uh, yeah. Thomas Paine was scheduled to be executed by the guillotine. He escaped. And so what you had is the reign of terror. Yes. After this. And, you know, they were going after anybody that opposes them. They were, they became an ideological uh, dictatorship that was where national socialism came in, you know, for Hitler and Mussolini and Marxism. This is where it started at this point. They were becoming socialist and very nationalistic. Uh, in fact, I was not sure if there was a connection to the French, this part, the second part of the French Revolution. I was not sure if it was connected to Marxism. And so lo and behold, I don't know how I found this. There's a Wikipedia page on this. Isn't that amazing. Uh, Lenin, in 1918, commissioned a number of statues of Rose Pierre for Russia. One was in the Kremlin. And they actually have a picture of the celebration of Rose Pierre in the Kremlin. And um, they got some person to make it. They didn't have much material because three days later, it fell apart. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine? Three days later, Rose, uh, Rose Pierre begins to fall apart. <laughs> uh, things uh, That was a uh, uh, foreshadowing for, uh, for, uh, for the Soviet Union. Uh, and so you need to know this stuff. There were really at least two major French revolutions, one where they're promoting liber um, um, supporting liberty uh, and the other one supporting more like socialistic and tyranny and uh, and uh, terror, terror. Uh, so libertarians need to know that this is their heritage, um, you know, and, and, and we sit on the left traditionally. And historians will, will, will say that, but, you know, uh, for example, everyone likes, um, uh, who is that? Um, there was a number of liber uh, classical liberals in the French Assembly in the 1850s. Um, I can't remember his name. And they, he said, and they said on the left. But when you dig a little deeper, what you find out from a couple of historians, I mentioned this, and I, I have one, it's a major historian, said that around that time period of, um, uh, 1850s, 1860s, the socialists and Marxists basically took over the, the designation of the left and their revolutionary ideals. And uh, that was basically the Marxists. They decided that they were left, even though I consider them on the right, they're authoritarians, but they said that they're on the left and anybody that disagrees with them is on the right. Everybody. So, you know, if you're not a hardcore Marxist, you know, you're on the right. Well, that means Barack Obama's on the right, Hillary's on the right. You know, I mean, you know, in the sense of of, uh, of a his of, of a Marxist one. And right. so, there's a historian that says, yeah, they stole it. You know, we we have you know claiming rights to the left. But the trouble is, everybody thinks the left is you know uh, uh, communist or this or that. So I brought in the term free left, and uh, and and to uh, versus the status left. So that's the kind of beginning of, of the uh, of the um, political spectrum. Um, and I do have two charts, one showing uh, what it should be uh, when it's um, um, during uh, during the time of the French Revolution and after what it should be. And it has the anarchists on the extreme left, it has the libertarians, it has the classical levels, and in the middle is conservatism. And then on the extreme right, you have social democracy. Next to that is Hitler and Mussolini, and next to that is communism. And but you could turn it around. That's that's the interesting part. Uh, you could you could say um, that the modern one. You could put the libertarians and anarchists on the right, and you could put the communists on the left, uh, which makes it conflicting. Um, actually, one thing I learned just before I uh, ended writing, I mean, done with my uh, writing. 
is that some people say it's better not to say left and right, say open and close. So on my charts, I have open and close, um, you know, open at one side, close the other. And then, you know, one is authoritarian, one is, you know, liberty. And uh, one chart, I don't even put down left or right. I just put down some of the ideas and, you know, the way it goes. And you can determine if it's left or right. So we, you know, so, you know, that makes it uh, why it's so conf con uh, confusing is because basically there's two of them out there and they're opposite. But the ideas are the same. Does, you know, so they call it left, they call it right. They, it's the ideas that are important. You know, if you believe in, you know, economic liberty and, you know, free, free press and, you know, uh, open markets, you know, I mean, what does it matter left or, you know. So, so you know, that's where I uh, came in starting at. Now, one thing I learned after finding out that, you know, the historical sabotage of uh, what mostly socialists and Marxist historians have done to the political spectrum, I said, you know, I bet there's some more myths out there. And so I started to look for myths. And they're just all over the place uh, on it. Let me tell you some of the more interesting ones. One is, you're always told that Marx is an internationalist, but he's not. He's a nationalist. He was a pan-German. He supported Germany coming together in 1840s, 1850s. He wanted the German people to come together, even by force to create a German empire. And he talks about, you know, uh, uh, like uh, we need war with Russia uh, for the greater glory of Germany. And you got Engels having terms like that. They're nationalistic. Uh, the Communist Party put out a, um, a, a short uh, piece on why Germany should be united and, you know, and why, you know, we, we should uh, have an empire. So they and, were on the right. Uh, pardon? So they were on the right on a lot of these issues. Well, I consider them, I mean, if you go by the traditional chart, by the French Revolution, they're, they are on the right. They're right next to Hitler and the Social Democrats, definitely. Um, but, um, you know, the, the, the thing was, is, yeah, right. Because I did an article recently, and it said, was Hitler the son of Karl Marx? And really, he he fits the thing. I mean, he fits it almost perfect, like a glove. It is incredible. I mean, Marx hated the Jews, hated Slavs, always wanted war because they said it would le lead to revolution. Uh, and um, he was socialistic. They both were socialistic. They both wanted conquest, wanted war. I mean, it's just, <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, I mean, that's a metaphor, but but they should have been. I mean, I mean. Marx was a Prussian, a German Prussian. These are people who really believe in discipline. These are people you don't want next door. <laughs> They're going to knock on your door if you do something wrong or barge in. And Hitler loved the Prussians, even though he was from Austria. Uh, yeah, Austria. Um, um, he he loved the Prussians. And so they're very close. They're extremely close. And I don't, you know, how can one be on one side, one be on the other, being so close philosophically? It makes no sense. And so that was one one of them, one of the myths. Another myth is a little more, a little more tricky. <laughs> what I found out, and this a lot of this came from books written by Jews because they really want to know what happened, you know, in the 30s and the 40s and, and so forth. Uh, but the the myth, the thing is, is that if you were a socialist starting back in the 1820s, you were almost automatically anti-Semitic. And I, you know, I followed the utopian socialists. Then a lot of them say, yeah, you got to get rid of the Jews. Some said you're going to burn them and put them and burn them in hell. Uh, they're leeches. I mean, Karl Marx said horrible things about the Jews. I, I have a number of memes just on some of his. I mean, some things I can't even say over, <laughs> probably over here how how he treated people and you know if they thought they were were Jewish or had Jewish tendencies. But but um, no, I mean, uh, and I have a historian that said, and it's in the book. They did a study of all French literature from 1820, and sort of the beginning of the, of the socialist movie, 1820, to 1920. He went through all French uh, literature. And that's where socialism really started, was in France. So he went through it all. He said he couldn't find one good word said by, social, by socialists about Jews. It was just basically all negative. And so, and, and the reason, go ahead. You want to say something? Yeah, I just want to say that's a real interesting fact. It's a really interesting fact, and one reason I found it is there is a speech by Hitler, 1920, I think it's August or September, and 
it's listed in footnotes everywhere, but I could never find it on the internet. Here's something in German from 1920. It's never been on the internet. Like it was never translated. That's an interesting thing about things that are translated or not translated. But uh, in that speech, he said uh, a couple of things. I can see why he didn't want anybody to see it. He said, you know, we are socialist. And uh, if you're a socialist, how can not you be an anti-Semite? It's called Why Are We, um, Why Are We uh, Anti-Semites? That's the name of the speech. And he talks about social justice, how great social justice is. I mean, you know, all the fascists talk about social justice, how great it is. You know, Mussolini, Hitler, I mean, on and on and on, you know. So, so here's something that was just fascinating. I had no idea. Uh, when I read that from Hitler, I said, I wonder if the other socialists believe the same way. Because, you know, the historians, social historians, don't want to include Hitler as a socialist. You know, you know, that's in the name, National Socialist German Workers' Party. <laughs> you know, how can you not be that way? You know, but oh, they always say it. And you look on uh, on the internet, and often you say, "Was Hitler so?" You'll see these articles, and I always say, "Oh no, he was not a socialist." Even though Hitler called himself a socialist over and over, not just a National Socialist, a socialist. There's one um, big speech he gave. I think in '41, it was an anniversary of the National Socialist. Uh, Workers' Party, you know, you know, the time it began back in the 20, 1920. And he said, um, we are fanatical socialists. That's the big line there. We are fanatical socialists. He didn't say national. He said, you know, they're really. And then I had to go a little deeper into it. OK, what about the national socialist? Well, there's a quote from Mussolini. It's, I don't have it well sourced, but I still put it in the book. And it because it's. Something that they all kind of believe. Hitler, Mussolini said that, well, we were all international socialists. Then World War I came along and we all joined in, you know, uh, with our government. Uh, now we're national socialists uh, and that's fascism. What happened was there was a big organization, uh, the, the Socialist International, the Second International, and they believed in national, uh, they believe in international socialism. There were parties, labor parties, socialist parties all over Europe. Well, 1916, that fell apart. It dissolved because so many members decided they wanted national socialism. They didn't want it national. They want national. They wanted that socialism within their culture, their language, their traditions, you know, and, uh, and, it, and at that point, some historians say now international socialism died. It was gone. Almost right. most socialism wanted to be nationalist. Stalin was a national socialist, like many books talk about. He, uh, Stalin said, in, I think in 24, 25, he says, it should be socialism in one country. Well, that's what Hitler would say, socialism in one country. So there's another thing. I mean, the Soviet Union was just a, a national socialist party of Russia, just like Hitler's was national socialist party of, of Germany, basically. There wasn't much of a difference. Um, and if you look at the history, um, the, uh, the the Russians always had these big plays, uh, the, the communist, and about the founding of the of the of the Soviet Union. And it's very Russian. It's very patriotic. It's very <laughs> yeah. and and there's some um, some uh, journalists that went into Soviet Union at this time. This is before World War II. And they were remarking about how nationalistic their socialism was, just looking at their plays, you know. And uh, and so um, um, there isn't really this. It's almost bogus to have international social. The whole concept it's just it's just not there anymore. Um, but they they want to say say that well the difference between Hitler and uh, and the communists were one was nationalist and one was internationalist. Well, not really. Uh, so that was a, a, a big myth, um, and um, I go into that deeply too. Um, also, another thing that's it's not so much of a myth, but but uh, when I started to trace fascism, you know, a uh, number of historians like Sternhell will say it came from France uh, in the eighteen eighties, eighteen nineties, but I think it actually came from the nineteen twenties in Russia. Because when you start doing the research, um, Lenin had nationalized everything by about 1920, 1921, and um, Russia was no longer a workers' state. They had no workers. The factories, almost all the factories were called, almost all the mills called. Because if you wanted to sell a paperclip, 
to someone in Russia, in Russia, you have to go through the government first. You can imagine how that uh, <laughs> collapsed. You could not do free trading on your own. Right. And 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 Russia was dead. And there was hundreds of, of demonstrations. Uh, Lenin had outlawed the unions. He outlawed strikes, just like Hitler had done. And there was riots. He he shot thousands, jailed th thousands of striking workers. Wait, wait, aren't these supposed to be the people? The <laughs> so so uh, he did something called the new economic policy, and and this is really interesting. There's a Wikipedia page on it, but um, Lenin decided that you know the economy is dead. There were no workers. He had no work. He didn't have a worker state. They're, they're they're dead. So he actually. It's hard to say, well, we need to go back to more free market elements. He actually uses the word free markets. And he also talks about we got to go back to the profit basis, too. Wait a minute. That's not Marxist. Marxists hate profits. But, you know, he had to do that because his economy had failed. Marxists and fascists don't know anything about economics, never do. And they often say, I don't know anything about it. Yeah. And so it's that probably. Pardon? It's a bragging point for them. It's a bragging point. So, um, so I contend that actually Lenin was the first fascist, not by perhaps the word or, or something, but by the actual. He he had to go back to more of a mixed economy, heavily heavily uh, uh, owned still the 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 the, you know, the, uh, the steel mills the. Uh, the oil fields would be owned by the government. That's there's a famous book out there that talks about that commanding heights, and so Lenin says, "Look, the the big business, the big uh, industry will be owned by the government, but we're going to allow privatization. We're going to allow these low companies to start, and uh, you know, and try to bring back the economy." So now remember, M uh, Mussolini loved Lenin. You know, he ran around with him and Trotsky up in Switzerland was about two thousand and three or four or five, something like that. And uh, in fact, Trotsky called Mussolini his best student. <laughs> uh, anyway, so uh, he, he, you know, uh, Mussolini uh, loved Lenin and he was following Lenin. Uh, the trouble with Marxists and socialists this time is that that by nationalizing everything in a country is supposed to bring you a paradise, a worker's paradise. And it didn't. And so you have Mussolini who started to back off away uh, from Marxism. I mean, he was a Marxist for decades, and so did Hitler. Now, Hitler, for a time there, for a short time, he worked for the the uh, Communist Party of Germany in 1919 in in, uh, in, in Munich. Uh, no, in Bavaria. Well, the probably Bavaria. And uh, he uh, there are actually photos of him in Germany with red armbands, <laughs> communist red armbands. He actually threw his hat in the ring when the when the communists took over Bavaria. The German Communist Party took it over. He threw his hat in the ring to be elected official from his barracks to the Communist Party of Germany. And uh, and they have records of it. They found archives. Thomas Weber in his book uh, found the archives. So so here you have um, you know uh, Hitler working for the working willingly for the communist, at least for about a month, and uh, and um, wearing a red armband and. Um, they don't like to hear that. The other side, no. Um, no. Uh, it's it, it's 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 amazing, and that's why my cover. I don't know. If I didn't show the cover to it. That this is why I have all three of them with red armbands on because they're all were communist for a while. You know, Hitler maybe for a couple of months. You know, before you know, and uh, Mussolini for decades, and then I think Stalin was born a communist. <laughs> Uh, so you get into the stuff that uh, the, of all these, um, um, you know, people say, oh, there's no connection. Well, there's tons of connection. I mean, look, look at Mussolini. He, you know, when he was a child, he didn't, his father didn't read him nursery rhymes. His father read him Karl Marx's Das Kapital <laughs> as a child. He was, he's now, some people consider him one of the, the uh, greatest Marxist theoretician of the 20th century. He has like 40, over 40 volumes of collected works. It, it's incredible. And, you know, and, and people think that, um, until recently, they, they didn't know that. 
You know, the Italian government after World War II wouldn't allow most of Mark of, of Mussolini writings to be known to the public. His his collective uh, works had never been published in, in English, never. People take little little snippets out. Historians who know Italian go in there and take little snippets out, and uh, and he, you know, he was a according to one historian, Mussolini was a uh, the um, belonged to the Bolshevik wing of the Italian Socialist Party, which he ran for a couple of years. He was the head of the Italian Socialist uh, Party, and so and he got kicked out because of the party, and this really hurt him because he was the one kicking out people. He was a radical. You got a moderate in there, a social democrat or, or something like that, kicks him right out. So he was kicked out because he supported World War I. He wanted Italy in the war. Well, so did all the other communist and socialist parties. Uh, nothing unusual about that. You know, and for some reason, he's not socialist. No, no, there's quotes of him saying, you can kick me out of this party, but you can't kick me out of socialism. Oh, uh, I mean, yeah, come on. But, but they think that 1914 point was when he turned against socialism. No, he turned against the socialist party, not socialism. Right. And, right. Uh, you know, and, and, and people just, you know, I mean, these historians, uh, socialist historians, Marxist historians, you know, you know, extremely biased and they just change history. They, well, they try to kill history and create their own new history. That's they gloss over. Them. Pardon? They gloss over the uncomfortable uh, facts here. Well, they just hide it, omissions. Yeah. That's their, you know, that's the least way to lie, I guess. They're, uh, you know, um, and, uh, and, you know, actually, Mussolini, you get a little deeper into it. I mean, because I have bought a lot of books. <laughs> you know, say, why did Mussolini want to get in war, um, you know, on the Allied side in World War One? Why do you want to do it? Well, because Marx said you should do it. Marx believed you should always support a war because it might lead to revolution. And so that's the argument he used. He was telling people because before that he was against the war. But it would, you know, he read back, you know, a lot of thought about Marx. Like, wait, wait a minute. This might lead to a revolution. Well, it happened in Russia. World War One led to the communists taking over the Soviet Union. Yeah, he's right. He was right. This was 1914. He's talking. He's 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 having these conversations through his newspapers and uh, in writings and everything like that. So he was just following Marx. In most cases, that's what he follows. I mean. You know, he started to back off from uh, Marxism in about late 1921, but a lot of people think he was just a closet Marxist because in 1934, um, he comes out with a speech to, to the deputies of, of Italy, you know, the, the, the Kaikar Congress, and he's just boasting. That's what the historian said. He's boasting that he has now put uh, three-fourths of the economy in the hands of the state. He had... More companies controlled by the state than any other country except the Soviet Union. And so he was just boastful it because he, you know, this is what he wanted. He wanted because that's what's supposed to happen. The people are supposed to own the, you know, well, it's, it's, it's the state. But, you know, he was a Marxist uh, in the closet for a while. The trouble with Hitler and, uh, and, and Mussolini, why they backed away is because, again, because of what happened in, in the Soviet Union you know, a destroyed economy. Now for Hitler, think about Hitler a little bit. One of his reasons for becoming a leader was to get back at England and France for World War One, for, you right. know, destroying Germany and, and you know, and so forth. So, so his ideas are, I got to have a big military, you know, and he's looking at the Soviet Union because in 1920, he said he wanted to nationalize everything, you know, in a 25 point plan of the Nazis pretty well. Right. You know, do everything. So why do you back away? Well, because you're not going to be able to punish England and France unless you can. Ha you have factories for tanks and, and bombers and artillery, and you know, you, you know, he's looking at he's looking up at the Russia and say, I, I can't do that. I won't have any anime, uh, and, uh, any tanks. I won't have any any armament. I mean, you know, you know. So he had to back off, and uh, but Hitler always wanted to do it. Albert Speer mentioned it in some of his memoirs where Hitler would get mad at sometimes say, I'm just going to nationalize everything, uh, you know, because he really hated the bourgeoisie, you know, he called him shits, you know, the, the, the shitheads or something like that. Um, so yeah, he hated, he hated them. And uh, unfortunately he had to work with them. He knew that they could provide the armaments, but uh, Albert Speer also said by, uh, well, um, uh, let's get back a little bit first here. Um, um, 
Germany, the best I can find, is by 1943, according to one historian, uh, about 50, about 500 companies were in the hands of the state. 1944, Albert Spears comes out and says uh, he's very worried because the the, 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 the the Nazis, the National Socialists, are talking about basically taking everything over. Uh, and he said that it looks like we're going to go towards um, uh, state socialism. Not state capitalism. State, he uses the word state socialism. Germany is heading in that direction where everything is going to be owned by the government because almost all the new uh, uh, war factories that were built were being built by, uh, by the German government uh, and uh, they were doing it in other countries too. And so, um, and he was fearful that, you know, when they won the war, <laughs> of course, which of course they didn't, uh, that uh, Germany would look like the Soviet Union. And uh, and that frightened Albert Speer. He was uh, he was in charge of uh, Arn ornaments, um, uh, find the um, you know the, the architect uh, Hitler's favorite architect. And uh, anyway, uh, but you can see why um, the, the, you know these changes. You had Marxists who want to be Marxist, but things were not quite working out well. The economy was not working well. And of course, if you don't have workers, I mean, Mussolini looked at the fact that the Soviet Union had no workers left hardly. And he's saying, I'm, I can't do that. I'm, you know, uh, the fascist was uh, the fascist party, which was originally called the, the uh, 1915, the um, fascist revolutionary party. Um, it was a labor party. Right. And in fact, uh, Mussolini wanted to call it the labor party uh, in 1921 at the third uh, fascist Congress. But at that time, he had people that were thinking more about nationalism and other things, and, uh, and they didn't want to go with the fascist labor party. That's what Mussolini wanted. So he had to settle for national fa fascist party. But originally, it was the you know uh, revolutionary fascist party. You know? um, so uh, he, the, you know they, they had to change with the times, and Mussolini was very good at changing with the times. But I don't think his ideas didn't really change. He just was waiting. And that's why I was so happy to see Italy, Italy become uh, very nationalized in uh, '34. So, so that's you know some of the some of the areas uh, that I get into. Uh, this is fascinating. I have, whole, I have a whole chapter on national socialism and Marxism. And what's interesting in that chapter is originally I called it German national socialism. Oh, I was wrong, because before Hitler came along. There were national socialist parties in England. Right. A couple of uh, people, two people got elected under that party's name with the help of labor in about 1918. There were national uh, socialist parties all over the place in Czechoslovakia, Austria. I mean, it's just on and on and on. So he was just one of many of them before he got involved in, in, in 1920. So, you know, and also even in 1920, um, it was funny. I have a couple of, of, of Conrad Haydn's he uh, books. He was the first person who wrote a biography of, of Hitler and lived in Munich when Hitler was there and uh, and reports a number of things. Uh, that's very, very fascinating. But the party that, that uh, Hitler took over, the German Workers' Party, at the time was considered left. Right. And yeah. still left quite well, quite a bit of time after that. But, you know, he was a social democrat, so, he, you know, didn't want to say many good things about it. Uh, but they were considered left. And, you know, and, and a and you you got you had people like Goebbels who often go around and says that Nazis were the German left, and then say something horrible about uh, the bourgeoisie or the right wing bourgeoisie. I mean, uh, Goebbels in his diary in twenty four said, "I am a German communist," you know, and uh, he wanted um, he joined the party in twenty five, and uh, at that time he said we should ally with Russia because Russia is a national and socialist country and. We have a lot, you know, a lot in common with them. So he wanted to uh, ally with the communists before Hitler did in, in 39. You know, I mean, it's, you know, there's so much evidence. I mean, I could go on for days on, on all the evidence to show that, that you know, Hitler is a socialist. He, he kind of liked the communists there for a while. Uh, and, um, and Mussolini was, was decades, decades running around with Lenin and Trotsky and, you know, on and on and on and on. There's just so much evidence. I mean, it's just 
it's just crazy to, uh, you know. You so, persuaded me to buy your book. I can tell you that much. Uh, I hope so. I hope so. Well, uh, see, a lot of these quotes are not sourced that you see in other books. There's other ones. Uh, people have written things like this, and they have footnotes, but not many. And, you know, I, I really wanted a footnote. I, I, there's times where every sentence is footnote. Yes. And, you know, it's so that future scholars, I, you know, it's like a textbook. It can, you know, here they have the actual data to use. Instead of just, you know, and it took me a long time, you know, fair, you know, vetting them and, and making sure it's a, it's a good source at buying the book or, or, you know, or getting digital or getting in print. A lot of these things are not digital. I had to buy prints. And my wife's complaining about it, taking over the big screen TV. I mean, it looks up. The, <laughs> it's a wall of books. <laughs> and uh, and I'm not sure I'm going to put them all. But uh, but, yeah, it, it, there's so many myths. In fact, I go into the history of myths. There is a fellow out there called uh, uh, Georges Sorel, and he's a French Marxist, the first thing you find out about him, uh, from the 18, 1800s. And I think he died about, eight, about 1922 or something. But he's the one that tried to save Marxism. Marxism was in a crisis. And I talk about the Marxist crisis because what happened was uh, you had a guy named Edward, uh, Edward Bernstein. He was working with Marx and Engels for many, many years. He was going to be the, the next Marx. And then Marx and Engels dies. And all of a sudden, he does kind of an inventory of Marx, Marxism. And all of a sudden, he finds out that everything that Marx has said, or at least predicted, was wrong. You know, uh, Marx said the technology was not going to go any further. Well, it wasn't right. He said there was only going to be big factories, never any small little ones. You know, no, no, they spread out. There was a lot of. A lot of stores and you know like that. Um, I mean, you got everything wrong. Uh, it's it's you know, there's actually a Wikipedia page on that, the crisis in Marxism. So here's Georgia Sorrell saying, you know, I'm, I'm a Marxist, and now Edward Bernstein, the, supposedly the you know the heir to to Marx and Engels, is saying that Marx uh, predictions are wrong. So he had to come some some way to to counter that. He came up with the idea of myth making. He said, it doesn't matter what the truth is. It doesn't matter. It's what perception is. Right. And because of that, the Nazis treated him like a hero, and so did the Marxist. In fact, and just before he died, he, he praised on, on uh, Mussolini. Mussolini said he was his men mentor. Um, and he praised on Lenin and the Bolsheviks, almost either in the same year, almost the same year. So he was, I would call, a fascist Marxist ideologue. And, and that's what we have to think about these things. Don't say just, oh, he's a commie or something like that. Say he's a fascist, Marx, fascist Marxist ideologue or has a fascist Marxist uh, mindset or something like that. They're, they're, fascism came out of Marxism. Many historians have said that. You know, Sternhill, A.J. Uh, Greger from UC Berkeley, I mean, on and on and on. They say it's a revision of it or a heretic of it or a, ver a version of it, but it all comes out of Marxism. And you, you, you know, you can't, you can't hide that. Uh, well, <laughs> well if someone tries to hide it. And so that's, that's a major myth right there too. Somehow fascism is on one side and Marxism on the other. Uh, that would mean that if you're in the middle, you're half fascist, half Marxist. That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's no sense of this. It's just all, a lot of it's just propaganda. And, and, you know, we're, we suffer with that because they're always coming up. Marx or sort of pro-Marxist or pro-socialist people always want to call anybody that opposes them a fascist. But they're the fascists. They're the ones, uh, if you go down the line, in fact, in the back I have a chart of all the things that the fascists believed in, or I should say the Italian fascists and, and, and then the National Socialists of Germany and then the Soviet Union. And it's on issues. And they almost agree with everything. I mean, you know. Germany, Nazi Germany had the biggest welfare system the world had ever seen. Socialized medicine, they had like 8,000 uh, daycare centers owned by the government. In fact, in 1933, Hitler banned NGOs. No longer could you uh, be a charitable group and, and help someone with their health care or food or whatever. It's banned because Hitler wanted to do social engineering, which right, usually right. most leftists or status leftists want to do. He wanted you know, to control them. If you didn't obey, you didn't you didn't get welfare. 
Well, you couldn't get a job. The Soviet Union did the same thing. Lenin, uh, Trotsky complained about that. But uh, but no, the biggest, well, and you have them even talk about, Gobel talked about how, you know, we have the best social welfare system in the world. And they did have, uh, they spent a lot of money on welfare. And that's one reason why they were starting to go bankrupt. They're doing, they were welfare and warfare state and right. eventually right. ran out of money. So what do you do? What does the government do when you run out of money? And you don't want to, you're already taxing the people already pretty hard already. Taxes are very high. Regulations were really high in, the, in, 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 uh, in Nazi Germany. Uh, most of the stock exchanges were closed down by, by Hitler. Uh, they had a lot of them, regional ones, and there was only a few left. In fact, the Nazis, when they took over, they said, let's get rid of the stock exchange. Because they hate, you know, hated capitalists. So they, they had a huge welfare, uh, warfare system. And what they did, well, what does the government do like that? They start plundering people. They plundered minorities. They plundered other countries. And there's a couple books on that about uh, Hitler's welfare uh, state. And, um, and the reason why the Germans went along with these horrible policies of Hitler, because they're getting a lot of money and, and, and furniture and furs from other countries. I was just pouring in from other countries. You'd get it really cheap, get things that were really expensive, real cheap. Um, uh, officers of, 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 of Germany, a Nazi Germany, could go into a Polish store and just grab stuff off the shelf. They didn't pay for it. Mm -hmm. says, the thing is, the Marxists and the fascists believe in, in theft. They don't believe in private property. So, you know, you have no right to that thing. The state does. And right. they don't believe in, in self in self ownership. And so it's easy to go out and kill millions of people because they don't own themselves. The state owns you. If the state owns you, they can get rid of you. That's where the genocide is. Uh, it's almost all socialists that have done den genocides. And that's because they don't believe in private property and, and, and self-ownership. That's why I have a chapter on uh, chapter five on the, um, the Democratic uh, Party uh, and, you know, how they started out uh, trying to bring slavery back in the South. South was dying in the 1820s, uh, 1810s, 1820s, um, because there was no theological reason to support it. It was just kind of economic. And the abolitionists were coming in and saying, you know, self-ownership, you know, you, slavery is man-stealing, according to William Lloyd Garrison. And they had to come up with a, a counterattack. And so the Democrats, new party starting about the late 1820s, uh, John C. Calhoun started to say, um, slavery is a positive good. In fact, there's a Wikipedia page on it. Slavery is a positive good. You know, I saw it the other day. Uh, and, and what they said was that uh, slaves have it better in the South than the free labor in the North. They're taking anti-capitalist points of view. They're talking about wage slavery. These were Democrats. Mm -hmm. and, and that's how they got very uh, popular. Uh, and, you know, and, and they used paternalism. They, in fact, one Democrat pro Slavery intellectual George Fitzhugh, and there's pages on him too, said that slavery is the best form of socialism. He even said it about you know communism. This is 1850s. He was a he had two books out, and he was an intellectual heavyweight that had a lot of influence in the South. They're you know very anti-capitalist, very pro-socialist, and slavery was good. It took care of people. He's talking about the welfare system. In fact, he moved so far eventually saying that, you know, there are people unfit, not just black, but there are white people unfit. So they should be put on the plantation too. <laughs> and then you, you think about today. Well, they're still putting people on plantations. But the Democrats, you know, decided that they couldn't win elections anymore after 1964 uh, civil rights. Uh, bill came out, got passed, even though they filibustered, the Democrats tried to stop it. And they realized white slave, uh, white supremacy wasn't going to work anymore because they were stopping blacks from voting. But now it was too hard to do it. So instead of white supremacy, he said, well, let's like, spread this out to everybody. It became government supremacy. Right. And really, there isn't much difference. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, white supremacy or, or, or uh, you know, government supremacy, it's the same thing. You're treating citizens as slaves. You take their wages. 
And that's what the abolitionists was talking about. You're, you're stealing from the blacks, the black slaves. You're stealing his wages. And, uh, but that's what the Democrats uh, like to do. And they still do. And so there isn't much. I mean, think about the time period when they're uh, taking down Confederate statues. And I said, okay, well, local areas, I want to take, that's fine. But why don't you take down the people who, who created the Confederacy, the Democrats? Why don't you take them down? So, so they want to take out the statues, but they don't want to take down the people who built those statues. Right. The, you know, later on, the, the Democrats. So, yeah. you know, are we running out of time? Well, do you mind if I get a little bit greedy here? Because we've got 10 minutes left, and I really want to pick your brain on a couple Go of ahead. things. Go ahead. Go ahead. said that. I appreciate that. Um, where, in terms of usurping the term leftism, how did that initially come about? Because you have the uh, the state left versus the free left, and we saw the French Revolution very quickly uh, uh, devolve into tyranny. Uh, how did that come about? How 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 did the leftist movement uh, devolve? What caused? What in terms of the causes? Well, because you know I'm uh, I'm Canadian. I live in a bilingual province. I'm very infatuated yeah. with French culture. Um, what uh, what caused that devolution there? Well, uh, first place I, I coined the word, and I coined it because it goes back to French, the free French. <laughs> They're yeah, the same way the country on. was taken over. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so you invented the nomenclature, which is a brilliant yes. identification, by the way. Yeah. But it, it, it's nevertheless true. I, the, the left has a lot of parallels with the American. I don't want to say far right, but the Tea Party. Like there, there's a lot of. Um, parallels with libertarianism there's a lot of parallels with we just want to be free we want mm -hmm. to be unshackled and then within a matter of 10 years you're looking at a reign of terror so in terms of causes what would you identify as a cause there the cause of how it changed yeah how, how did it well, go from a movement of freedom to a movement of tyranny well the okay the problem was with the with the marxists and socialists is um I mean, they did, uh, after Robespierre killed the 22 French assemblymen, they took over the whole uh, par French parliament, basically. And so they were sitting on the right and the left, you know. And um, anyway, what happened was they didn't, nobody wanted to be on the right because that meant authoritarian of the monarchs. People hated the monarchs. For a right. long time in, in in Europe, so you know, even though they're authoritarian, should be on the right. They act like it. They talk like it. Their ideology was the same. You know, they're all into propaganda. They're all into you know changing things around, stealing words, stealing concepts, stealing everything. They don't believe in private property. They don't believe in rights to <laughs> to, to a, a certain thing. They're the ones that change it. The Marxists came out and basically said, "We're on the left, and anybody that's opposed to us is on the right," because so the right at that time was considered bad because. No one liked the monarch, and um, and a lot of people didn't like the church because they act like little tyrants. So the, it, it, it was a despotism masquerading as yes, left. yes. You, uh, you, they always do that. I mean, right. you know, these the the, the 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 status left. You know, if they call you racist, that's probably because they're a racist. If they call you fascist, because they're a fascist. They just don't know what fascism is. I've said this a number of times to people that. You know, you know, I go down the line of what it is, and I say, "Oh, that can't be." I, well, I got all these footnotes. I got all these historians are saying major historians. I mean, Sternhill is one of the best historian in, in fascism, and A. J. Greger from UC Berkeley is also one of the leading experts of fascism. You know, and so you know, I'm not taking them from little minor people. Right, right. It's just yeah. that they're not going to promote them. I mean, Thomas, okay, l l think about Thomas Weber's book, uh, um, uh, both of them. You know, one is um, uh, Becoming Hitler. That's the most uh, recent one. And he goes, half the book is talking about Hitler as, is, as a, uh, you know, as a, as, as a communist. Uh, or, you know, he doesn't quite say that because he never says, in it. we don't have words from him. All we know is he you know, he joined the, the German Communist Party. Does that mean you're communist? Well, I would think so, but okay, <laughs> anyway. And so you go read book reviews of it, even though half the book talks about Hitler uh, with being a leftist. I mean, you, you know, he first from a leftist at this time. No one talks about that. 
No. So you go find some historical site that says, "Oh, here's he has another book out. He's you know he's a German historian, German born historian, and they, and they just won't talk about the Red Armband. They won't talk about him joining the the German Communist Party and not resigning when things are really bad. I mean, I mean when the communists took over Bavaria, they started uh, taking people hostages and shooting them. They started taking uh, food out of people's stores." and buildings and wanted to start building a red army. Some said it was 20,000, I, I doubt that. And they're going around terrorizing the, the, the place, people marching with red flags, even, what was it? Um, Rudolf Hess was in the Red Guard and uh, they don't want anybody to know that, but uh, anyway. But uh, yeah, it's just a matter of propaganda. They are very good at propaganda. We're, you know, libertarians and classical liberals are interested in the truth, not propaganda. And it takes a lot of effort to, you know, go through the pages of history and time where people say and make a case, you know, this looks like this is what happened. They don't have to do that. You know, Goebbels, when he would write, he would get a newspaper article, look at the headline, wouldn't read it, and then start attacking whatever party or group he didn't like. Right, right, right. Uh, in terms of uh, a middle term, it seems to me as though there's a... Uh, a tendency from the extremism. What I found very fascinating was when you had pointed out that uh, the Marxists had never said anything positive about uh, Jewish people. Um, Marxist or socialist. I mean, there are a lot yeah, of, there was a time that period. That yeah. Yeah. But uh, you, you know, the tendency to say what's uh, true of the part is true of the whole. What's true of the whole is true of the part. Okay. Well, some men do this, therefore all men are guilty. Or, uh, you know, you can apply this to uh, races or to religions or to an economic class. It's this Marxist analysis of uh, here's this one particular class and we'll do the power analysis. Um, it's well, what you're talking about. Go ahead. Collectivism, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's what I'm trying to get at here. Yeah. Yeah, it's collectivism. That's why they're racist, because, you know, that's why. Communists are always killing communists. I mean, you know, communist countries are always attacking communist countries and mil millions have died. I mean, come on, you know, Red China and and uh, and the Soviet Union, they had big battles out there in Mongolia area. Some people say as high as 500,000 people died. Red China invaded communist Vietnam, communist Vietnam invaded Cambodia, uh, communist Samoa invaded communist uh, Ethiopia. I mean, it's on and on. The third Re Russian revolution, we had three communist parties trying to take over Russia and killing each other. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, Lenin was attacked by the uh, um, uh, Socialist uh, Revolutionary Party in the Mensheviks with about two, two, 200, 2,000 men, uh, uh, artillery and machine guns. They attacked Lenin's Kremlin. And that was happening all over Russia because they wouldn't share power. They decided the Bolsheviks were going to be in charge and screw you, the other, other groups. And so there's a massive uh, so they call it the Third Russian Revolution. Then you have Trotsky. It's Stalin killed all the Trotskys you could find in Spain during the Spanish Civil War. That's where Orwell decided that uh, this was not for him. He had joined a Trotsky group to fight Franco. Well, instead, the Stalinists were fighting Trotskyites in Spain. Right. He almost got killed. Right, they're right. always killing you because because if one group is slightly different than the other group, they're the enemy. We're individuals. They don't, we don't care what other people right, think. Right, 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 right. So the missing middle term here, and we've got about three minutes left, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll give the final word to you, but the missing middle term, the connection between fascism and Marxism and perhaps today modern leftism, if you'll permit me the use of the term, is collectivism. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Uh, any sort of uh, concluding thoughts? Well... I mean, um, you know, <laughs> I'm always trying to sell books, you know, and, <laughs> Here we go. and uh, you know, uh, you know, I, uh, um, you know, I do have, I did have a, a, a Facebook that was unpublished on killing history. Now it's kind of back, but uh, with everything gone on it, I have all these memes on my killing history, killing history dot net. Go to it. My articles there and tons and tons of other stuff. Are we lost? No. Hello, are you there? Are you still there? Can you hear me? I can hear you, but I don't see you. Oh. Okay. Anyway, just uh, if if it's still going, uh, just go to my uh, Killing History 
dot net uh, site and my articles, my memes, grab the memes. There's hundreds of about a hundred of them. And they have quotes from all these people and uh, and um, real, real revealing. And so, uh, you know, hopefully you'll get the book. It's on Amazon. Well, I'll tell you what, I might take up uh, Karl Marx's advice and uh, plunder some of those memes. And uh... <laughs> Yeah, well, they're there. You just click on them, take them. I, you know, I try to get them on social media. Okay. Uh, sometimes it doesn't always work, but uh, anyway. All right. Well, thank you so much. This has been one of the more uh, interesting talks. Uh, I suspected it might be based on the description, and you definitely uh, delivered. Uh, so I really appreciate that. Uh, wonderful, uh, wonderful education in terms of uh, the history and putting uh, some pieces together that we all kind of speculated are there, uh, and you really solidified the uh, the historical uh, component of that. So I uh, I really appreciate that. Thank you for coming along. Okay. Okay.